Oh, it's always good worshiping with you. Let me say this at the very beginning because I won't say it later. Uh, In this church, we believe in Jesus and we talk about Jesus and we invite all people to follow Jesus. And the gospel of Jesus is the message we preach. And it is, as Paul says, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's the core gospel. It's the good news. And I hope you know the story, but more than knowing it, I hope you experience it. Uh, Many of us in here have united ourselves with Jesus in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. And we have done more than believe it. We have changed ourselves. We have been changed by him. We have given up on our sin. We have given up on ourselves in some ways. We have lost ourselves in him, been buried with him, immersed, which is the word baptism. And so today, I would invite you, if you have never done that, to do that. I've been reading this week about what you already know, that people today are anxious and discouraged and depressed. Some of our people in this country are more and more, and our young people are more and more wondering if life is even worth living. They feel inside they are somehow empty and hollow and dead and more and more hopeless. Hopelessness has taken root in our country and in our hearts. It has done great damage to us, and it seems to be growing. It's becoming a great epidemic. And don't you wonder, why are some people overcome by their circumstances, while others in similar circumstances become overcomers? Why do some people feel completely hopeless, while others with similar stories hold on to hope as if it's all they have left? What makes the difference between people? I was reminded again again about a book I had read some years ago, and I've shared this. I I suspect you might know the story. It has shaken me and encouraged me at the same time. Uh, Maybe you remember the name, her name, Elizabeth Smart. And if you know her and know her story, maybe you've read her book too. It's, It's horrific. It's unimaginable what she went through. It's also inspiring. She was at the time a 14-year-old girl living in Utah, raised in a Mormon family, following in their faith. She talks about family and faith and her life and her ordeal, and it's the, the book is called My Story. Uh, the terror began for her as she was in her own house, in her own bed, June 5, 2002, and a man broke into the family home and took her at knife point, and held her captive for the next nine months until until she was rescued from the horror. That very first night, she walked out her own door and hiked with him through the woods and up that mountain that was just by their house, and he introduced her to the equally despicable wife of his, and she was then treated as a second wife, even as she was a young girl. She became a slave, in my language, and nobody to them, cabled by her foot, held captive by their evil intentions, while calling themselves God's messengers, which is sickening, he thought of himself as a prophet. She was sexually assaulted that first day and every day, treated like dirt, and it is nightmarish, her story. Uh, She knew hunger, she knew pain, she knew humiliation, fear, and you could say despair. And I don't think any of us in here could say, well, I understand that. Of course we don't. How could we? And the feelings that went with that. But do you know what? She never lost. She never lost hope. She never gave up on the faith she had in a God who would not leave her. She never let go of a hope that she would someday see her family again. She believed it. And this is what she wrote after that first terrible experience with them feeling used and broken and worthless. These are her words. I believe in a God who loves me. Never was I angry. Never did I blame God. God wouldn't leave me to suffer through this alone. And of all the things she felt, she never felt hopeless. Claire Booth Luce said, There are no hopeless situations. There are only hopeless men. That's right, isn't it? In some ways, almost the circumstances don't matter. I mean, they can be horrible. But how how does one person get through it and one person get devastated by it? How does one give up on hope completely and another hold on to hope? The stories like that inspire me, uh, that even in the worst of times that are gut-wrenching to even read about, some refuse to quit believing. They, They cannot stop hoping. 
they will not let go of hope. Maybe you've heard this poem before. It's called On a Sunny Evening. On a purple sunshot evening under wide flowering chestnut trees upon the threshold full of dust, yesterday, today, and days are all like these. Trees flower forth in beauty, lively to their very wood, all gnarled and old, that I am half afraid to peer into their crowns of green and gold. The sun is made a veil of gold so lovely that my body aches. Above the heavens shriek with blue, convinced I've smiled by some mistake. The world's a bloom and seems to smile. I want to fly, but where, how high? If in barbed wire things can bloom, why couldn't I? I will not die. That was uh, written around 1944. World War II is going on. These are the children of the Terezin concentration camp in a couple of the barracks, and they think their ages were 10 to 16. 10 to 16, writing like that. And then these words discovered after the war was over, scribbled on a wall in a cellar in Cologne, Germany, where some Jews were hiding from the Nazis. Maybe you've heard this one. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God, even when he is silent. I don't know that we could put ourselves in any of the shoes that I have already mentioned today in any of those places. How can you live like that when you fear for your life, when you watch death come and evil show up and you wonder why the world is upside down and why God isn't answering your prayers. And what if you felt that? What if you faced that? The annihilation of your people living as Jews in Europe in the 1940s. Esther knew the feeling. Esther in the Old Testament faced something similar. She didn't give up on her faith or her trust in God. She refused to let go of hope. What if you lost everything that was valuable to you, your livelihood, your possessions, everything, including including your own children and your health? What would you do then? Job knows that feeling. He faced it. He wrestled with a God who understood it even if he couldn't, and I don't know that he ever understood it. But he did not give up on his faith in God, and he did not let go of the hope that he held on to tenaciously. What will you do if... God asks you to leave your home and go somewhere I will show you later? What if he asked you to believe the impossible? What was inconceivable? An old man and an old woman having a child, grandparents giving birth. What if then he asked you to take the one son that you love, the gift he gave to you, and said, kill him, kill him. Abraham knew, Abram knew. He had a faith that still believed in a God that could even raise the child from the dead, even when he couldn't know it. He knew it. He hoped it. He believed it. Hope is all the way through the Scriptures, even in the worst of times. Listen to the psalmist. Psalm 25, my hope, Lord, is in you. Psalm 33, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Psalm 39, my hope is in you. Psalm 62, yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Psalm 71, as for me, I'll always have hope. I'll praise you more and more. Psalm 147, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. And there's more. I like Psalm 42 because the preacher preaches to himself. The man who finds himself in total misery and says it, still says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And after he thinks about just how hard it is, by the end of the psalm, he says the exact same thing. Preaching to himself, put your hope in God. We hold on to hope, too. We trust that God will give us what we need to make it through our days, even if our days end in death here. For other people who might say it's totally hopeless, we do not find it hopeless. Of course we get tired. Of course we get frustrated. Of course life is hard. We fail, and we fail hard. Of course we wonder what is happening. Why is our world turned upside down? Why do things happen like this? And is God even listening? But we hold on to the promise of God, believing that He will bring us through this. Isaiah 40, even young people grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow grow weary. They will walk and not even faint. Here we are, 
2023 in Brookline, Missouri, a long way from Esther and a long way from Job and a long way from Abraham and a long way from the Psalms, here we are, a long way from Jerusalem, where someone named Jesus was put up on a cross and died and then laid in a borrowed tomb and for his own followers could not have been probably more hopeless than then. Because hopelessness is a feeling that can work its way into your soul at any time, but it is never more dangerous and powerful than when you face death. When you imagine, can you imagine uh, being a disciple on that day and watching Jesus die on the cross that day? Can you imagine feeling the feeling, seeing him, listening to him, watching him, believing in him, following him? knowing He is the one, and then watching Him as the blood drains out of His body. Is there anything more hopeless than that? must have been a hard, hard, dark, dark Saturday, even if the sun was shining, when all of their hope was put in all of this man, this one man who truly was, they believe, the Son of Man and the Son of God, the Messiah sent to save them, and now He is lifeless and in the tomb of stone how much more hopeless can it be? Who could have believed it? Even they couldn't believe it. The disciples of Jesus, even when they were told, couldn't believe it. Three days later, on the third day, on a Sunday morning, just like this when he came out of the grave. Maybe it sounds like a fairy tale to some people. Maybe some would giggle at what we're saying in here. That's, the, that's a legend. That's a story. That's a fable. That's a fairy tale. It's not true. Oh, it's a cute story. You religious people like to tell each other to make yourselves feel better, but it didn't happen. And what if it didn't happen? What if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen at all? But what if it did? But what if it did? Maybe there are fewer and fewer people who believe what this church believes, that Jesus is the Son of God. He was sent as the Savior of the world. He was prophesied long ago. The coming Messiah came, and He came, and He taught, He preached, and He lived, and He loved, and He healed, and He did the impossible. Not just that. When He was put in the grave, He did the impossible. When on a Sunday morning just like this, He rose from the grave, and He now waits, the risen Lord, at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the day when He will come back, and He will judge every man, and He will right every wrong. And maybe we're weirdos for believing it, but we believe it. Some may say we're fools, but we'll be the fools. Some of us have done more than believe it. We have united ourselves with him, joining him at his death, in the grave, and in the resurrection, believing we will also rise one day with him. We are not hopeless. We even look at funerals differently today than the rest of the world. We mourn. We cry. If you were in this room Thursday night, we were crying. But as Paul said, we mourn with hope. If you're like me, you've buried a lot of people, friends and family, way too many funerals. And I've cried a lot. You know me. I've cried a lot. I've done it this week. But we mourn with hope. Jesus stood at Lazarus' grave, his stone-covered grave, and Lazarus' sisters are there and they're crying. And Jesus says to one of them, at the tomb, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who believes in me will live even if he dies. Do you believe it? And we believe it. And it's more than just believing that it happened. We have been changed by that fact in history. Because see, The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is our power. The same Father who brought him out of the tomb is our Father, who right now is working in us and through us. The same Spirit who enlivened the once dead body of Jesus now dwells within us. We who are his, Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, by his power God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us too. Romans 8, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. And further down in the chapter, we ourselves who have the first, who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, 
the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. There is a significant difference between me and famed agnostic Richard Dawkins. I've mentioned him before. He is a smart, smart man, now an old man. And he's written about and wished things were better here on earth, but he hopes for nothing beyond this. There was a recent interview, if you heard it, with Piers Morgan, and he was asked, what do you think happens when you die? And Dawkins replied, as Bertrand Russell said, I believe that when I die, I shall rot and nothing of my ego shall remain. And, and Morgan asked, that's it? Yes, he answered. And so he pressed it. Nothing. There's nothing else. And Dawkins said, how could it? How, how could it be otherwise? How could it be otherwise? He and plenty of others these days believe once you are dead, you are just dead. Nothing lasts longer than the body. There is no evidence. There is no fact. There is no history that points to anything beyond this. But I believe in God, and we believe in eternity in the Jesus who came from the Father and then came out of the grave after He was killed on a cross. It's not hope. I mean, it's not wishful thinking. It's hope. And it's not simply optimism. It's faith. It's trust. It's assurance. It's confidence. That's what hope is. Of course, it's hard here. Of course, we will suffer and struggle and stumble. And we will die. But Paul's perspective is powerful. 2 Corinthians 4, we are hard-pressed on every side, speaking as an apostle. Not crushed, though. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And he speaks of Jesus, and then he says, because we know, because we know that the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. We believe the impossible. We believe it happened. We believe it's fact. It's history. It's true. Of course, if it's not true, this is terrible. This is embarrassing. If this is not true, we might as well go home because this is a joke. At Shep's Memorial, right here, Brian, his father, stood at this podium and said the truth. That the resurrection of Jesus has changed everything. Christians who believe in Him we have not been duped. We will not be embarrassed. We are not wrong. This is truth. Now, if it's a lie, if it didn't happen, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But there is a resurrection. You don't need to feel sorry for us. Our preaching is not useless. Our faith is not in vain. We are not stuck in our sins. We will not be stuck in our ground, our tomb, our grave. We have hope. We have hope because of Jesus, because of the resurrection of the dead. And that's why Hebrews talks about this hope as an anchor. It's what grounds us and keeps us and holds us and pushes us on. Even when the worst comes, we will hold on to hope. And the worst will come. Christians in here can tell you the worst still comes to believers. Divorce papers are filed. Inflation soars, bills come, money flees. The boss might let you go. The tests and tests keep trying, but still no baby coming. The results come back, and it is cancer. There is war over there and threats of more war here. Morality goes down, crime goes up, and little by little, hope seeps away and fades, and pretty soon you are wondering, why is the world turned upside down, and what is God going to do? And if you, like me, have been to too many funerals, it becomes wearisome, wearisome. But God is not surprised by our tragedies. He has not gone anywhere during the days of heartache. Things do get hard. Frustrations, confusion, it becomes faith shaking at times. But He understands. He knows. He's got this. Hopelessness may be knocking at your door, seeping into your heart. It can come and spread like an epidemic. 
It sucks your breath away. It takes them right out of your lungs. It paralyzes the body and the mind. You don't want to go anywhere or do anything, and you do not think tomorrow is worth living. And nowhere is, is a hopelessness more profound than standing at a grave. But when those disciples got to stand at Jesus' grave and it was empty because he was risen, it changed everything. And even if everything in this life kills us in the end, the resurrection reminds us that one day even death will die. The sting has been taken away. The grave is becoming powerless. And one day death will be defeated. Back to Elizabeth Smart before we're done. People magazine, she recounted the horrors of that experience at the hands of pure evil. And she said, I always knew that no matter what, I'd still be part of my family. They could change my name, change the way I look, starve me to death. But they couldn't change that I am Ed and Lois Smart's daughter. That was a powerful thing to me. No matter what comes to you, do you know this? If you are in Christ and you are a child of God, then no one can take that from you. The Apostle John reminds us, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That is what we are. And all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure, He says. The hope of the resurrection doesn't just give us hope for one day out there somewhere someday. It changes our lives today. We are changed people because of what He has done. So, we're going to sing one more song. And if you're here at Brookline all the time, then maybe we sing it too often. Maybe we do, but I love it. Good song with good lyrics. It retells what happens in the third verse, what happened on that Sunday when Jesus was in the ground. So the words are in verse 3, there in the ground, His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave He rose again. And as He stands in victory, for victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am His and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. And then verse 4, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. So, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I will stand. And I hope you sing this like you mean it. Let's stand and sing. In Christ alone.